That's me. Not one of the people skating, but the guy who makes these things. And today, I'm going to tell you about a Scottish sport which we Canadians have dominated. It requires a team of four, and it's a sport which saw its Olympic debut right here in this very town. But this isn't a story about speed skating. It's a story about where these people are speed skating and the other thing they do here. Curling. This is Karizawa. In 1998, Olympic curling was reborn here. And for the years since, they have hosted an international tournament here. This is the story of one of the most challenging, exotic, and delicious events on the World Curling Tour. This is Far From Home, Karizawa. no idea what to expect. I hadn't heard much other than it was busy and there was lots of people. Uh, but really, I didn't have any kind of expectation. As soon as we touched down, so how was your guys' flight? I was in awe about everything about this country. It was just so amazing how nice everyone was, how clean it was. It was just eye-opening and I loved it. The ladies of Team Sweeting are also traveling with Team Canada, skipped by Pat Simmons. In addition to Jerry Gertz of the World Curling Tour, Team Unjun Kim from Korea, Murdoch of Scotland, Elena Petz of Switzerland, Sidorova of Russia, and Adine from Sweden, almost all of whom are traveling straight to Japan from a Grand Slam of Curling event in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. Many of them have already been on the road for weeks. And for the elite curlers on tour, this final event before Christmas will mark the end of the first half of a long and grueling season. I think when you take us out of our normal, usual setting uh, in Canada or, or in events where we know all the teams, um, you know, it makes it a little more special in a sense that you kind of become teams within teams as far as, uh, uh, you know, you, you chat a little bit more with, with certain teams, with rivals perhaps. Um, you know, obviously with our, with our ladies team, you know, we feel like a Team Canada here. So it's, it's kind of got that almost like a Continental Cup kind of feel in the sense that you're part of a little bit bigger team here as well. There's something special about that for sure. The event kicks off with a press conference featuring the international skips alongside the best from Japan. There's Yusuke Morizumi and Shinya Abe on the men's side. Ogasawara, Fujisawa, Matsumura, and Ida represent the elite of the host country's women. During a short question and answer period, teammates watch from across the room. 2015 world champion Nadine Lehmann describes this in her Swiss-German accent. Like brave astronauts about to be launched into space. The curlers are put on display for the prying lenses of local and national media outlets. Manabu Aoki observes from a distance. In many ways, Manabu is like the Jerry of the Asian Pacific tour. But I'll get back to them later. Because what came next was the banquet. I was expecting a small curling club. I wasn't expecting this many sheets. I wasn't expecting this many people. And the knowledge that everyone has of curling and how this whole town is curling, like everyone just really, really loves the sport. And they're so excited to be sharing this place with us. Several local chefs had been assembled to cater the event that evening. The culinary offerings serve up a snapshot of what the town has to offer and the chefs embody the spirit of Japanese craftsmanship and honor. Even the local pizza restaurant puts on a prideful display of talent and skill. There's a guy frying up smoked cheese from France, hamburgers from America, everything all mixed up with nuts and cookies. 
local fare, and traditional favorites that make for easily one of the most fascinating and delicious buffets on the World Curling Tour. The food has been amazing. I can be a little bit picky at times, so I was a little bit worried, but it's been actually really good. The culture is very different, the food is different. A bit of a time change too to get here, and uh, we haven't been in this country before. Uh, it's a really beautiful country, uh, just uh, different from what we're used to. We got to try like a whole bunch of different things. The whole thing was a stand-up, which was really unique. And we got to have specially made sake for the event, which was super good. Um, we got to bond with a lot of teams that we wouldn't normally you know, have time to even bond with. And it was nice to see them here. It was nice to see everyone come together. Being able to travel with Team Canada, the guys, has been a great experience because we have been able to socialize with them, get to know them. I mean, we've talked to them a few times, but we've never been able to have fun with them, you know, joke and laugh and try new things. And that was an experience I will never forget. After a few final speeches, a toast with local sake made for curlers by curlers and a bunch of pictures and birthday cake, the teams disperse back to their hotels for the evening because the next morning, they curl. As far as the environment goes, it's not as different as I was expecting it to be. It's very homey and the trees and the town is just so beautiful. It kind of reminds me of like a ski place in Canada. This facility is just amazing. The viewing for the fans is great. There's lots of cool little things you can buy and souvenirs to take home. And this curling museum to sit in here where Alexandra Schmerler won gold. And, and that's really neat to see that kind of Canadian roots on the wall. Val speaks, of course, about the legacy of the 1998 Nagano Olympics. Nagano is both a city and a prefecture in Japan, which is their version of a province. While curling was one of the original Olympic winter sports in 1924, it would only be a demonstration event at a few games until being reintroduced as a full medal event right here. When the city of Nagano hosted the Olympic Winter Games, they tasked Karizawa with the curling event, making it the first city in history to host summer and winter Olympic events, having also hosted equestrian events during the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games. Canadian and world champion Elaine Dag Jackson was Team Japan's coach when curling marked its return to the Olympics. Everybody in Karizawa is supportive of the sport of curling. If you go elsewhere in Japan, you know, you may find people that don't know what curling is, but in this town, it's the curling town. And there was a lot of money involved coming out of 1998, which they used a lot of it to reinvest in the growth of curling in the Karazawa area and beyond. So what that has resulted in is a lot of emphasis in building curling and building the Karazawa curlers to be better, to have many, many more people in that area curling recreationally. It takes quite a long time to build a curling culture. We know that in Canada, we've been working on it for 100 years. So in Japan, you know, it, it, it's taken since 1998 to really build some great numbers of strength, not just a player or two, but some greater numbers. And as soon as you have more than one team competing in a country, they make each other better. And in Japan now, there's several really great teams. So they are challenging each other within their country, as well as coming over to international play and challenging themselves in other parts of the world and it's just making them better at home and abroad. Another Canadian helping the Japanese gain international experience is J.D. Lind, who some of you may know from his days curling with Charlie Thomas and Brock Virtue, but today you will find him in Hokkaido coaching their women's program. The system that they have here is very similar to the Canadian system. They choose their own teams, they have a national championship to determine who's going to go to the Worlds every year, and they have to make sacrifices to curl, just the same as most Canadians do. Because not only do they have to juggle the same things that most Canadian teams do, but they also have to leave their families for a month at a time to go to Canada to train, and it's not easy, but uh, they do it, and they do it because they love the game, and they do it because they want to be top in the world. They're taught to memorize things and they're taught to, I guess, learn a skill to perfection. 
and to study really hard and to try and master something. And they take that into curling also. And for me, it's been really interesting seeing them approach it more of like a craft. Instead of like a sport, it's more of like an art form or something for them where every day they go and they try and practice their craft and they try and perfect it. And for them, it's very much their life here. Ever since the Japanese discovered the sport of curling, they immediately identified with it. They thought that it was the perfect sport for them, which it is. When you go out on the ice, it's a battle. Everybody wants to win, and uh, the Japanese and Canadian curlers alike are just as focused on what you have to do to throw the rock as well as you can, to play the scoreboard as well as you can, and to learn all those skills and perfect those skills. And Japanese curlers have truly embraced that. It's really a sport in Japan that they consider a huge growth opportunity. The Winter Olympics, the viewership numbers for curling came second only to one of the figure skating events. So curling as a spectator sport in Japan is, is very popular. Uh, you're talking like numbers in the tens of millions that, you know, in Canada we'll never reach that number even if we grow the sport as, as big as we can. The curling broadcast in Japan is a real show starting and ending not only with games, but tons of other supplemental content in order to teach viewers about the sport and its players. Here, we see Yusuke Morozumi travel to the Kataguchi Sake Brewery, where he helped prepare the special curling sake that everyone's been talking about. And while Morozumi makes a great bottle of booze and plays a tight game of stones, he struggles to secure wins against international teams like Nicholas Adin. Scotia's Team Sidorova of Moscow has been curling for a month across three different continents. And while their skip Anna fails to qualify with only one win in the round robin, she won her second European Championship only weeks prior to this event. She's got nothing to prove at the moment. Japanese hopefuls Koana and Ida both go 2-2, two and two, narrowly missing the playoffs, along with Korea's Eunjun Kim. 2015 world champion Alina Petz and Canada's Val Sweeting both qualify with 3 and 1 records. They live to curl another day. We got to do so many cool things. Every day was jam-packed with activities. Usually when we're at an event, there's no time to go and enjoy what the community may have to offer or look around, you know, eat, sleep, curl, and then you're back at the rink. But this has been different. We've been very lucky with the weather. It's been sunny and so nice. We got to go to the temples. We learned how to pray. Um, our host was absolutely amazing. I could not have asked for a better host. Yes. I'm dishonest. <laughs> That's what? what I got to do. Oh, <laughs> take care of yourself. Be careful of drinking. Oh. <laughs> the people are the kindest, most respectful culture that I've ever come across. What's yours, Michelle? Mine says uh, childbirth. All right. <laughs> Just <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> Illness. Childbirth. It isn't serious, but it may take longer than expected. <laughs> oh they are genuinely just caring and giving. I just, I've loved every minute of it. It's a beautiful country, but mainly you can just feel the energy of the people here, and it's a pretty special place. They just treated us like gold. They taught us so much about the culture and the traditions, and that meant so much to us because we wanted to really learn about the country and, and learn about some of the traditions and the culture. We got to go have ramen noodle bowls. We got to see and try new food and try a lot of new food and kind of test each other's boundaries and see what works and what doesn't work and, you know, put ourselves in a whole new situation. And now, I hope you're excited for the most thrilling part of this program. Curling scores and general World Curling Tour administration just kidding. 
I make fun of Jerry a lot. But really, he's probably one of the hardest working guys in curling. While everyone else is competing on the ice or socializing in the concourse, Jerry is in meetings or supplying the world with curling scores, along with everything else, curling. He runs the website curlingzone.com, in addition to the entire World Curling Tour. I've literally seen nights where he doesn't sleep because he's responding to questions and comments in every time zone except for the one we are living in at that moment. At this point in the season, he's feeling burnt out. And while I get to go climb mountains with Team Sweeting, Jerry hasn't left the arena. So Manabu decides to take us to the oldest curling club on the main island of Japan. First, we grab some coffee and medicine and hit the road. We ended up venturing down to the Miyota Curling Club in a nearby community to Kirizawa called uh, Miyota. You kind of drive up front and it, it, it's kind of a nondescript metal building and you know it looks a lot like an average curling club in your average small town that's been running for a long time. It's the first curling club on the main island in Japan, Honshu. Hiroshi Kobayashi and his brother and several other people as well. They really put a lot of work in to get the sport off the ground. And after we kind of saw the club a little bit and got a feel for the facility, we ended up sitting down like you would after any curling game and shared a cup of coffee with the group. And for me, it's very much an education to come to this country and see what curling means and how everything worked. But it still very much prides itself to be similar to that Canadian culture of the game. Speaking of Canadians, Team Simmons had just finished up with Team Morizumi, the pride of the Japanese men's field. They go into the semi-finals with a 4 and 1 record. Hall of Fame curler Earl Morris, their coach, represented three different provinces in three Briar appearances, moving around with the Canadian Armed Forces. He coached and developed Rachel Homan's team for nearly a decade, and his son John threw multiple Briar appearances including one victory. He continues to coach John on Team Simmons, but if you ask most curlers on tour, Earl the Pearl is known for one thing, karaoke. It doesn't matter whether you're a recreation curler or you play at the top levels of high performance, uh, you've got to have fun first. Nobody's going to be making a million dollars curling, but if you want to do well, you have to spend time traveling. So it automatically becomes your social life in the winter time. So you can make the choice to stay in the hotel and do nothing, or you can get out like most of the curlers do and uh, party a little bit, and it might include karaoke, or going to a bar, or whatever the case might be, that's what they do, and I think it's a great part of the sport. That's the beauty of curling. You can be very competitive, but social at the same time, and it's pretty cool. ロシアの Val Sweeting and her squad lost their quarterfinal game to an upstart Korean team, and while Alina Pets battles Ogasawara, Dana forgets the brooms. We played against the Japanese teams we already knew, so we knew that they will be hard to beat. And at the end, we lost against two of them. They really try hard to develop in the sport, and I think over the next years, um, there will be more Asian teams, higher ranks than, than now. Team Canada, originally skipped by John Morris, opted to change their lineup in the middle of the 2015 Briar to see Pat Simmons skipping and John playing third. It worked. They seem to always win when it really matters, but not today. Murdoch and his band of Scots are dangerous, holding their own Olympic silver medals along with many other accomplishments. They fought like warrior poets. They fought like Scotsmen and won their freedom. I mean victory. David Murdoch claims the men's title, bringing home a piece that is the legacy of Karizawa to the land where the sport was born. The Canadians take home silver. Japan 
その経験や実力を補ってきているので本当これからはもっともっといろんな強豪国とカナダであったり世界チームと試合をしてもっと経験を積んでいけば、まあ、世界に通用していけるんじゃないかなと思います。えー、国内では2強である私たちの本当に最大のライバルで,ライバルであるチーム藤沢と決勝を戦ったんですけどもあの本当に素晴らしい海外の強豪が出場した中で決勝で日本のチームが戦うことにすごく私は嬉しく感じましたし誇りに思います。The Asian teams are definitely going to be giving us a lot of competition in the next five to ten years. In the next one to two years, they are getting stronger unquestionably. Each one of them, I believe, for their own reasons. There is a ton of competition in Asia right now. You have the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Koreans all extremely talented. And every year, only two of them get to go to the World Championships. There's a lot of motivation for all these teams to try and one-up each other, to try and get better, to get to the World Championships every year. In talking to David Murdoch himself, playing with the flag on his back is really important to him within the game. You know, it doesn't matter what he does all season long in the, in the cash wheel events and tour events. And what really comes down to, and, and the pride of playing for Scotland, is, is winning that World Championship, that European Championship. That、uh, they can bring back home to the country, and it really felt like a major international championship the way they run this event. There's only been a few events, I would say, over my career that I, I would say that I was, you know, kind of sad and, and the fact that they were over. And sad maybe just from the fact that you may not get another opportunity, and this is certainly one of them. I feel like it brought us closer. And even just the curlers closer.、Uh, I mean, you go on tour, you go into the events, and you stick to yourself. You very rarely talk to them, you don't make conversation, you go to the rink, you curl, you come home, and you're pleasant. But here, we've been chatting with people and talking with people and sharing our experiences, and we don't get to do a lot of socializing outside of our sport. Like, we take it very seriously. So, I mean, yeah, we had fun here, and we got to experience that together. But just even experiencing something new. And I don't know, I just feel like it's gonna take us that next step for the Olympics. And it's brought us closer, and it gave us the experience, and it was something that I think will make us better and stronger moving ahead. And as the Canadians head home, each with fond memories of an event like no other, everyone is reminded of one thing their country is not the only one with a thirst for dominance in curling, and their future reign on top. Feels a little less assured. And so they continue to travel in the pursuit of victory. They continue to travel far from home.